And uh, boy, the odds didn't look well for David. I mean, there wasn't much there that would that would tell you he could possibly be victorious in it. But the difference there was that God was for him. Now, we can't overlook the, the faith of David in all of that. Of course, the world, and they try to interpret the Bible, they'll, they'll interpret it completely aside from faith. They, they won't even look at faith at all because they don't believe that that has any difference or makes any difference. But, of course, it does. <laughs> it does. And, uh, you know, like Malcolm Gladwell uh, he doesn't attribute any, any of that to faith. And so how do you make the thing work when all the, ob, you know, all the odds would be against David winning that battle, and yet he wins decisively? And so then, then they have to figure out, well, how could that have happened? And, of course, you remember Malcolm Gladwell's interpretation that he was suffering from a pituitary gland issue, and so he was very limited, and, well, he was physically handicapped, according to um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, and David was not the, you know, um, um, the underdog in the story, according to him, because they're trying to make it work apart from faith in God, you know, which makes the story completely ridiculous, you know. But anyway, they have to do that, you know, because they don't believe in faith. That's evolution. It has to all be explained by natural means apart from anything supernatural. Okay. But uh, Romans 8.31 is a good verse to remember because faith is simply putting God's words to the test, trusting what God said. And God said, you know, well, Paul said, in God's word, if God be for us, who can be against us? So if you come up against a, an odd that you feel like just not gonna, you're not gonna get come through victorious on this end, remember what the Lord said in His Word and trust what God said, like David trusted what God said that He would sit on the throne of Israel, and knew that He'd come through that thing, not because of His talent or ability, but because of what God said that God would have to do something to make that thing, you know, to get David through. So, anyway, so this is the story of David and Glad. We mentioned last week that this whole thing, you know, this picture is really bad. All the artists do a very poor job of interpreting the text and so forth. Uh, you know, he's got Goliath with the sword in his hand. He didn't have a sword in his hand. He's got a shield in the other hand. He didn't have a shield in his hand. There's no spear. He has a spear. That was in his hand, but not, <laughs> not these other things. But at least they have him, you know, as a giant and a formidable foe there, muscle-bound uh, character. That's, I'm sure, more what he looked like than most of the other artist's renditions. So, you know, you take what you can get there, but anyway, at least you get the, the idea. And this is the battlefield, and uh, um, Goliath's going to be defeated here this week <laughs> in our lesson, hopefully, if we get that far. And uh, you're going to see the retreat. Which direction do they go? And they flee. I mean, they're running for their life after David defeats uh, Goliath. And so uh, you see the direction that they're going. And by the way, the Philistine camp is, uh, well, you see that thing right over, if I can get my pointer here, on this side over here. And I can't see it on there. Does it even show up on there? Nope. <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, it's over there in the corner, um, in the top. And uh, so you see they come right down that mountain and right straight down that road there. All right. We're going to start reading in verse 38. But before we get too involved, let's go ahead, ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, we're grateful this morning for your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a blessing to be here, Lord. We know it's by your grace and by your mercy that you've uh, brought us together. We pray that you'd, you'd uh, speak to our hearts, give us what we need from your word, and open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, your word is, is quite a book. There's all kinds of levels to these stories and things that you're doing behind the scenes that are not readily seen uh, in the words, but you can, we can obviously see that you're working and doing things. 
And uh, so, Lord, help us to appreciate your word, not just in this story, but all the stories that you placed in your word. There's, there's all kinds of things there uh, to be mined. And so uh, I pray that you'd help us and give us wisdom this morning. And I pray your blessing be upon it. Pray for the uh, 11 o'clock service when our pastor comes. And again, 2 o'clock. I pray that you'd just uh, speak to our hearts and give us what we need from your word there. Uh, I pray that you'd increase our faith and help us, Lord, to be more of what you'd have us to be. And Lord, help us to be receptive to your word and, uh, Lord, obedient to it. And uh, thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Beginning with verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a, a helmet of uh, brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword uh, upon his, uh, his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. So you see, Goliath wasn't carrying a shield. There was a man who carried that shield for him. And when the Philistine uh, looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Victories are given, they're given, they're not earned. See, David's already given credit to the Lord for giving him the victory. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to, to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. All right, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Saul attempted to help David out, right? Here's some armor. We want to protect you. You're going down to face Goliath. You're going to have to have some armor. I'm here to help you. <laughs> but there's a number of problems with this help, right? And the verse said that vain is the help of man. Now, number one, he attempted to arm him with carnal weapons, right? This is Saul providing armor for David. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So the weapons of the Lord are not carnal, and yet um, Saul was going to help him out with some carnal weapons. Now, granted, David was coming against a physical enemy, right? And the Bible says in Ephesians, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay? So 
He is going to fight Goliath. But Saul completely overlooked the spiritual side of this battle, right? He didn't pay any attention. And that's why he was afraid. Everybody was looking at the physical. Right? See, the faith of David versus the fear of Saul in getting the victory here. That's all the spiritual side. The Lord's working things out on a spiritual level, and it'll all come to fruition in the physical level when the spiritual level is all worked out. But that's God's business, and he takes care of those things. Number two, this help will only serve to level the playing field, which would benefit Goliath. I mean, Goliath does not need... Um, I mean, David does not need to be slowed down by this heavy armor. So by wearing the armor, it would have helped Goliath out. As we see how it all turns out, I mean, David's running toward Goliath. If he had this heavy armor, it probably would have been a dangerous situation for David. Now, one of the keys to this victory from a physical standpoint was speed. David was a lot quicker than this giant. And that's pretty typical. The bigger the man, the slower he is. Not always. There are some big men that are fast, but typically they're slower than somebody who's smaller. Saul's armor just would have slowed David down and would have taken away that advantage that David had. Again, now we're looking at physical advantages, but we're not... We don't want to miss the spiritual side where God's working things out. Number three, the armor also would have covered some of David's youthfulness. Right? Put a helmet on him. You put this coat of mail on him. You do all this stuff for him, and it would have hidden his youthfulness. And obviously, the appearance of David without armor led Goliath to, according to verse 42, disdain him. That's going to work in David's favor. See? The armor wouldn't have worked in his favor, but the fact that he was a youth worked in his favor. Now, this sight of David, this youth coming down the mountain, hurt Goliath's pride, which led to overconfidence, and that led to his undoing. More than likely, he wasn't wearing a helmet. He sees this youth down there. I bet he threw his helmet off. He said, why would I need a helmet? This guy doesn't have a helmet. That's going to make me look foolish, you know, with all this armor on here, and this guy's going to fight me hand to hand, and, and he doesn't even have a helmet on, right? Which that left the target available. If that's true, I don't know, I'm... I'm surmising here, you know. But if that's true, then it was a good thing that he didn't have armor, you know, so that Goliath could see his youthfulness and be overconfident. All right, the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things. Notice that David refused to wear the armor because he had not proved it. And that's what he said in verse 39. I have not proved it. The it in that verse is a particular piece of Saul's armor. His sword. And I can't use this sword. I can't use your armor because I haven't proved it. The Bible says there, and David girded his sword. That's the sword that Saul gave him upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. It is, goes back to the word sword. And that's uh, a reference there. That's the antecedent. Now, do you know what's really interesting about that? You know, it's really interesting. The first time the word proved occurs in your Bible, it was used by another great type or picture of Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, in the context of testing the validity, the truthfulness of the words of some men. 
Isn't that something? Here's Joseph in Egyptian royal apparel addressing his brothers in Genesis chapter 42 and verse 16. And that verse says, Send one of you and let him fetch your brother and ye shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved. Let's see if what you're saying is true. We're going to prove this this thing. Now that means something because we all know that the sword is a type or picture of the Word of God, Hebrews chapter 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. All right? And here, David refused to use a sword that had not been proven worthy. He wasn't going to use just any sword. It had to be a sword that was proven. Now, if God's people had that same kind of attitude toward all these new Bibles, those new Bibles would have gone away. They wouldn't be here. But they've just go, they just went ahead and listened to men try to help them. But vain is the help of man, see. But men say, well, you really need this. This will help you to understand the Word of God better. Oh, okay. And they just go ahead and grab a sword that's not been proven. That's a problem. Now, the proliferation of Bible versions, it's market-driven. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 in the King James Bible. For the love of money is the root of all evil. They're making money off these new versions. That's why they're putting them out, to make money. If they were really more accurate and everything, and uh, you really believe that, why aren't why isn't some rich Christian, and these people are making money at these things, why don't they just give them away? Well, they're making money off that. And they want to continue to make money off it, and that's why they keep putting them out. It's never been driven by truth. Oh, they frame it that way. Oh, we got new manuscripts, better manuscripts, you know. We've learned things from archaeological discoveries, you know, letters written by people, and we understand now how words are used in these languages that we didn't know before, and so we're getting closer to the originals. That's what they say. We're getting closer to the truth. And so that's why you need this rather than this old King James Bible. That's what they say. All right, planning ahead. Boy, isn't that important? Plan ahead. In verse 40, we see David getting five stones and putting them in his scrip. Why did he put five stones in there? Was he a bad shot? <laughs> he knew that, you know. He knew the percentages, you know, he sets up a target, you know, while he's out taking care of the sheep, you know, and it takes him five shots to hit a target, so he's going to get five stones. Is that, is that how that worked, you know? Well, maybe, didn't, maybe David didn't have access to the information found in 2 Samuel chapter 21, but Goliath did have four sons. And one of those four sons is called a brother, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, he's got four sons. Maybe David said, I might have to take care of some other giants here too after I take care of dad. I don't know. There might be some other reasons for it. By the way, that verse says, these four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And the names are listed. See. Now, if David didn't know anything about Goliath's family members, he still might have had to face some Philistine opposition. 
including, you know, the guy carrying the shield. Can you imagine a fellow having to carry uh, a giant's shield in light of the weight of all his armor? That had to be a massive shield. That guy was no weakling, you know. That guy was probably muscle-bound character, you know, having to handle that shield and carry it up and down a mountain every day for 40 days. That guy was, you know, no slouch. And uh, David probably figuring out, I might, have to, I might have to deal with that guy too. So there's reason to have more than one stone, but there's some things to think about there. Suffice it to say David was somebody that planned ahead. Guy's never had any military experience, but he's thinking. He's thinking. Boy, how unusual is that today? People don't think. They don't plan ahead for anything. You know. They buy signs just to remind themselves to think. Yeah. <laughs> think. Think. <laughs> All right. It's really quite simple quite simple. In verse 40, the Lord defines a word that we don't use or hear very often. How many have ever heard the word scrip on the streets, you know? You're shopping somewhere and you hear somebody, you know, overhear this conversation, people talking about a scrip. You know, that's, that's the things that, you know, the new version promoters bring up all the time. Well, those King James words Nobody, nobody speaks those words. You're never going to hear those on the streets in Knoxville or any other place, you know. This is the 21st century. We've got to get rid of that old Bible. And, yes? Really? Well, amen. That's, that's good to know. But here, you know, the rest of us who weren't in the military wouldn't know what that word meant. We're told what it meant, you know. It's not limited to, you know, just those who've been in the military or, you know, somebody familiar with their Bible or something like that. You're told what the word it means. Somebody's reading the Bible through for the first time they come across that thing. The first time it shows up, the Lord tells them what it means, right? It's the word script, and it's used seven times in your Bible. And verse 40 is the one and only Old Testament reference. The rest of them are in the New Testament. But it's defined here uh, in the Old Testament. And this is how the Lord deals with archaic and or obsolete words. See? If something is obsolete and archaic, the Lord will tell you what that word means. See? He told you one time that uh, you, he started talking about a seer, and he said uh, a prophet in old times was called a seer. And so he explained what a seer was so that you'd understand what it meant. And so he does, he does the same thing here. I mean, he doesn't avoid those archaic words or those obsolete words. He doesn't avoid them. He puts them in there and tells you what they mean. It really is uh, hypocritical of, of folks who will stand up there and complain about the archaic words and nobody understands them and then the guy will tell you what this Greek or Hebrew word is and spend 10 or 15 minutes explaining what that word means, but won't take one minute to explain what a, the obsolete word in your King James Bible is. What is that? That's somebody who's puffed up with his education and wants you to think he's something and knows something that you don't know and wants you to look to them for the answers to what the Bible means. See, that's what that's all about. So the Lord defines them so that people understand. The Lord's interested in understanding. Right? He's concerned about that. He wants people to understand his word. All right, here's Goliath, and he just received a stone in his forehead. It wasn't a grazing, you know, glancing blow, man. It was right in the forehead, and it sunk in, see, the Bible says, but God shall wound the head of his enemies. Verse 41, 
Goliath was on the move. However, from the text, it looks like he sat down at some point while he was talking to David. You know, or maybe, you know, he's hollering up at the armies of Israel and he's sitting down because nobody's going to come down and fight him. Or maybe he starts talking and, and sits down in the middle and just waits for somebody to come down. You know, for 40 days, nobody came down. For 39 days, nobody came down. And so he probably, you know, son's probably beaten down on him, takes his helmet off. And then he sees this youth coming down the, down the mountain. See. And it all, you know, begins right there. Now, how do we know that? How do we know he was sitting down? See? Well, verse 48 says that he arose. If he was already standing, you can't arise from that position. You'd have to be either sitting down or lying down, one or the other. So he's probably sitting there. And in addition, it certainly seems likely that Goliath took his helmet off at some point, right? So the stone hit him right there in a vulnerable spot that was not protected by his armor. And again, he sees this youth coming down with no armor at all. Why would he all of a sudden say, oh, well, you know, maybe I better put my helmet back on, protect myself. That'd be kind of dumb. If you've ever watched sporting events where people wear helmets and they get aggravated and frustrated and they're going to start a fight or start throwing, some people take their helmets off, which is really stupid, but they do that, you know. Look how tough I am, and they whip their helmet off and attack somebody who already has the helmet on, and they're <laughs> not smart, you know. But there's Goliath. He's going to look foolish if he puts his helmet on to fight a youth right, who doesn't have any armor at all. Besides the fact, he's angry. You know what happens when people get angry? They don't think. <laughs> they don't think. And that's why, you know, a lot of athletes like to make their opponents angry. They start talking and try to make them angry so they don't think, you know. Now, it's likely that when Goliath disdained him that uh, he sat down took his helmet off. Now, his words show that he did not consider David a threat, and removing that protection would illustrate that perception. You're not a threat to me. I can whoop you with a helmet on or with a helmet off. I don't need it. Now, if that all happened, it was his pride that made him do that. He's offended that a youth is coming down, right? Why would the Israeli army think that I, you know, a mighty giant, a champion of Gath, right, here, that they could even think about sending a youth down, you know? How come they're not sending their best warrior? Just sending this kid with no armor on. Doesn't look like he has anything. Well, Proverbs 16, verse 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. That guy's filled with pride. You just have to listen to his words. He tells David, you come down here, and I'll feed you the birds, you know. Now, good dogs are rewarded. Bad dogs are put down. I mean, you have a bad dog, bites somebody, you know, or whatever. You have, to, you have to put them down. Dog has to be killed, right? But a good dog, you know, you treat them right. They're rewarded. Now, the first question that uh, this type or picture of the Antichrist asked David, a type of Jesus Christ, he says, am I a dog? Now, he's obviously filled with pride by this question. You know, you think I'm a dog? <laughs> but that's quite a question. As a matter of fact, he was. If you're a Gentile, you're a dog too. <laughs> We're Gentile dogs, according to the word of God. 
the Lord Jesus Christ called the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7 a dog because she was a Gentile. Racism, you know. <laughs> well, Goliath was a Gentile. If that woman was a dog, he's a dog too. Now, there's good dogs and there's bad dogs, and we all understand that. That woman was a humble dog. She didn't get offended when Jesus Christ called her a dog. And he did all of that intentionally. He set her up to just shine, and boy, did she shine. <laughs> but Goliath, on the other hand, was a prideful dog. And the Lord can't do anything with a dog that's filled with pride, <laughs> except kill him. <laughs> that's all you can do. Now, that humble Gentile woman got exactly what she wanted from Jesus Christ. She wanted some help. And the Lord says, he, he kept putting her off. You know, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm not sent to Gentiles. And she says, well, if I'm a dog, yeah, I don't get a full meal, but at least I hang around the table and get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he said, okay, and gave her what she wanted. She was humble. Goliath, on the other hand, got wounded in his head. That's the place where pride originates. It originates right up here. You know, uh, the Bible warns about thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You know what that is? That's pride. That's pride. Pride's a head problem. It's always been a head problem. The Bible also says they shall fall and never rise again. Never rise again. There's absolutely no doubt that Goliath suffered a depressed skull fracture based on the wording in verse 49. The Bible says the stone sunk into his forehead. He had a depressed skull fracture. No doubt the blow also called, caused massive bleeding due to the multitude of blood vessels in the face and scalp area. That guy was a bloody mess from getting hit right there. Right. You imagine that scene? And Goliath may not have died from his skull fracture, but I believe that he would have died from it if he hadn't been beheaded first. I think that was a mortal wound right there. Now, number one, it would have taken a great deal of time and energy for the Philistines to recover their fallen champion on an active battlefield, right? It would have taken a lot of time and energy to get him off an inactive battlefield. The guy's a giant. How many men is it going to take to carry him, put him on some sort of a stretcher and carry him off the battlefield and get him some kind of attention? Right. So time, you've got a depressed skull fracture, time is essential. You, know? you want to get that guy attention quickly, right? but it's going to take a long time. But that wasn't an inactive battlefield, that was active. Now, if he had been evacuated, what kind of medical treatment did they have in the, at their disposal to treat this kind of an injury, which could have also included traumatic brain in injury? What, what could they have possibly done in those days for anything like that? They might not be able to do anything today with all of our technology and everything. What would, it, what would they have done in Goliath's day? There's nothing they could do. So I think it was a mortal wound. Now, if you read your Bible, you know the Lord has a sense of humor. He's got a sense of humor. Isn't it interesting that Goliath cursed David by his gods? By Goliath's gods, he cursed David. One of Goliath's gods was Dagon. 
Dagon. Remember Dagon? Remember what happened when Dagon, in his own temple, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines, which was right there in his, in his temple. You know what happened to Dagon? <laughs> he fell on his face. He fell on his face before the Ark. Goliath is about to face God's anointed. That's David, right? God's anointed king of Israel, a type or picture of Jesus Christ. God's anointed face to face, and guess what's about to happen to him? Well, we read that story about Dagon, and we say, down goes Dagon. <laughs> well, it's about to be down goes Goliath, just like his God History is about to repeat itself. Imagine that. Imagine history repeating itself, you know. Well, maybe it used to, maybe it used to repeat itself, but boy, we are so smart now. We've learned that we're evolving and getting smarter and better, and now we can look back on history and say, well, we're not going to make that mistake again. <laughs> you know, all across Europe and all these Holocaust places, they, they have signs that say, never again, never again. And they keep those museums open to remind people, this is what happened in history. We're not going to let this happen again. <laughs> and Solomon said, history repeats itself. You can have all the museums you want and all the concentration camps. You can take people through there and show them the pictures and you can do all the stuff. But don't tell me it's never going to happen again because of what you're doing. You're trying to keep history from repeating itself and the Lord said it would repeat itself. And it will. By the way, when Goliath cursed David, the Lord's anointed by his gods, uh, it was over for him. Right at that point, those words came out of his mouth. It was done. He was finished. Toast. It was already over. <laughs> he was just waiting for the stone to hit him. That is, if God wasn't already through with him, those words right there, boy, that, that, was, that was the point of no return there. All right. 1 Samuel 17, 50 through 54. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way uh, to Sherem even unto Gath and unto Ekron. That's a fulfillment of David's words there. Not only am I going to kill you, Goliath, but there's going to be a great slaughter of the Philistines this day, and that was a fulfillment of David's words there. Verse 53, And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Got a couple of questions here. Actually, you know what? We're not going to get, we're not even going to get started with this before. Anyway, I'll give you the two questions here and uh, make you think about them uh, at least. In verse 50 and verse 51, there's a couple of questions related to mysteries. You like mysteries? I like mysteries. I like, uh, you know, seeing how things are solved, and whether it's a novel or a mystery, a crime thing, where they're trying to figure out who did it or whatever. Those things are interesting to me. And one of them, you know, on the surface doesn't seem to have any connection to this story, but it may not be quite so obvious, see, these questions. When you're reading God's Word, you know, read it with an open mind and let the Lord provide you with some questions. 
not questioning the validity of the words of God, but asking questions. Now, well, what does that mean? Isn't that a strange wording there? How does that, does that occur any other place? And that makes you try to find connections in the word of God, see? Questions are helpful to learn, you know? You know when you're in the classroom and you're, you know, growing up and you're, you don't understand something, you raise your hand and you ask a question. I don't see how that, you know, I'm missing something here, you know. Can you help me? Can you go through that again? Or what about this? What does this mean, you know? You know what that does? That helps you to understand. And when you're reading your Bible with waiting for questions to come into your head, good questions, right? Those are designed to help you understand God's word. Now let's examine these two verses under a magnifying glass. and We're not going to get too far, but we'll take a look at them and see if the following questions can be answered. Number one, who done it? Who did it? Who actually did it? And uh, what done it? What was it that fulfilled this thing? See, I'm going to read you the two verses and we'll be done today. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Well, did you notice in verse 50 it said that he slew him with a sling and with a stone, but in verse 51 it says he slew him with a sword. What was it that slew Goliath? See, that's the question. Something for you to think about. And then who actually killed Goliath? I know it says David, but did David kill him? All right, we'll look at those things, Lord willing, next week.